can I please ask you to take a seat? Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It is an honor and pleasure to welcome you all in the name of LATCAM here at the Zurich Development Center. Most of you know me. I'm Tatiana Gaspar, the Managing Director of the Latin American Chamber of Commerce in Switzerland. And I will be accompanying you throughout this afternoon. First of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the Latin American ambassadors who are with us today. Her Excellency Claudia Buzzi from Brazil, uh, Her Excellency Cecilia Haber from Mexico, His Excellency Frank Tressler from Chile, His Excellency Pedro Dalotto from Argentina, and no, no, está bien, está bien. And His Excellency Alberto Raggio from Uruguay. And His Excellency Luis Castro from Peru. Sorry. We are also very honored that two Swiss ambassadors decided to join us. Her Excellency Marian Yeni from the Embassy in Ecuador. And His Excellency Gabriele Derighetti from the Embassy in Costa Rica. Furthermore, I extend a warm welcome to Ambassador Mirko Giulietti and Ambassador Benedict de Serja from the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and to Minister Hervé Laure from SECO. <laughs> Our chamber has seen some turbulent times, but lately we have reached a level of stability which inspires me confidence and optimism for our future development. Throughout the past years, when we had to rethink our existence and reformat our activities like everyone else, this stability was largely made possible through the generous support of our partner, Switzerland Global Enterprise. LATCAM is deeply grateful and I'm happy to welcome from SGE, Thomas First, Martina Bittenharder, Bruno Aloy, Adriano Burghi and Benjamin Werenfels. <laughs> Your entire team made extra efforts to bring participants for uh, today. Thank you very much for that. But the stability of any association or chamber also depends on the continuous loyalty of its members. We are especially thankful for the generous support of our patrons who, together with SG, sponsor this event in Globo. Bank Julio Sper, Credit Suisse, Neodent, Nestle, Novartis, Roche, Swiss Re, UBS, Fontobel, and Zurich Insurance. I'm delighted to welcome two representatives of our patrons, our board member Sarah Hörner from Bank Julio Sper and Andrea Covini from Zurich Insurance. Well. I also like to welcome very warmly LATCAM's two wonderful vice presidents, Linda Walker von Grafenried and Gabriela Lippe-Holst. As well as our board member from Swiss Life, Nuno Silva. The past two years, my attempts to organize a Latin America Day in presence, once even here, were thwarted both times at very short notice due to COVID. The entire program had to be transformed into a mega Zoom event virtually within days. Both webinars were successful and well attended, but this is so much better, being able to network and enjoy each other's company. SGE seized the opportunity of this traditional flagship event 
and invited the Swiss Chambers from Latin America, their cooperation partners, to spend this week in Switzerland for training and corporate visits. I am thrilled that the representatives of 11 chambers are here with us and ready to talk business with you. They will have the opportunity before the break to come on stage and introduce themselves. I also want to say a few words about this beautiful venue. We are here at the auditorium F007. In case you're wondering, no, nothing to do with James Bond. <laughs> What is now a state-of-the-art conference center used to be the original site of the Bircher Benner Clinic founded in 1903. Dr. Maximilian Bircher Benner was a visionary pioneer in holistic natural healing. He believed that diet, exercise, work and spiritual peace were all key to a healthy life and mind. The world-renowned Swiss health food Bircher Müsli was created by Dr. Bircher Benner, very probably on this campus. And 120 years later, his vision about a healthy life and mind is more relevant and needed than ever. I'm glad that we get to spend a calm and positive moment in such a wonderful place. We are all painfully aware that peace and well-being are precious and rare commodities these days. Each crisis that unfolds somewhere in the world seems to trigger yet another larger and deeper one. It can be quite a challenge to stay positive. Our speakers from the financial universe, the public sector, from infrastructure and social responsibility and its widest sense will be able to focus on positive aspects, on chances, opportunities, success stories, and on providing a hopeful perspective also for Latin America, a region that is close to all our hearts. I hope you will appreciate and enjoy the program we put together for you. In each of the larger sessions, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. Our welcome staff will bring you the microphone. The entire program will be recorded for our YouTube channel, LATCOM Switzerland. An information for our speakers and moderators. We have headsets and the technician is happy to help you, but I think everyone before the break who um, has already their headsets, so that's fine. Now I'm delighted to hand over to our Vice President, Gabriela Lippe-Holst. Gabriela stepped in at the last minute for our President, Ramon Esteve, who could unfortunately not be here today. She will say introductory remarks in the name of LATCAM, immediately followed by Thomas Fürst, who will speak in the name of SGE. Please, Gabriela, the floor is yours. You. I'm testing it, and it's working. Is it good? Fantastic. Welcome, everybody, dear minister, dear excellencies, dear patrons, members of the LATCAM, dear friends of Latin America. It's a pleasure to be here and welcoming you officially in the name of LATCAM and in the name of Ramon Esteva, our chairman, who unfortunately had to go to an emergency board meeting and could not come today. He's sending his very warm regards and looks forward to seeing you at the next event. Let me address you with a few words and thoughts about Latin America and particularly in the turbulent times we live in now. We know that the geopolitical risks have increased and it is now a priority in almost every company in risk management to assess what priority we have in the geopolitical risks and what the impact is going to be. One thing that we did at our own company was to try to work in scenarios and work on different potential scenarios and see what actions could we take from the scenarios to be prepared of what we could think of or hopefully uh, think enough in priorities. It is important to plan ahead strategically and prepare the teams for all of these scenarios because it is flexibility and speed that will allow business to survive and continue and actually strive because risks bring also new opportunities when they're assessed uh, correctly. What, for example, happens if further lockdowns will happen in China for a longer time and destroy the supply chain? 
what will happen when the prices of energy go up and to what amount will they go up? How can we then deal with potential saving measures? What reputational damage will our companies uh, endure if we do business in certain areas of the world, in certain regions? What happens when we see, like in the last two days, in Pakistan, one third of a country being flooded with 33 million people being underwater? All of these risks are very important and they are global. However, the responses are local. And we see many different responses in many different countries that do not uh, uh, follow exactly the same path. The same is true for Latin America. And if I just look at the prices of energy, for example, or right now in Switzerland, today we have uh, an announcement where the population is asked to save on a voluntary basis. In Spain, for example, two weeks ago, they have already started to impose sanctions and energy measures to save uh, more energy. This is a very important point because whenever we assess the risks in whatever region, including in Latin America, we have to look very locally and look at what the responses are of the local governments as to what they do. It also brings uh, good things with it because competition brings the best out of us. And I think that to see many different countries uh, taking different measures will show what the best measures could be for all of us in the different regions. But I think uh, that one of the very important uh, topic is the shrinking globalization trends. And that uh, has also led to inflation of prices because it has lowered the threshold for companies to rise their prices. And the central banks that are uh, often there, not in all central banks, but many has as a mission to have price stability. This is certainly true in Switzerland. It's not the case everywhere. This will become a key central point as to watch how government will respond and whether the mission of their central banks is price stability or not, or whether they will adapt it uh, going forward. If I look at uh, the inflation rates, it's 3.4% in Switzerland right now. We're still very lucky for this. It is 8.5% in the US and 8.9% in Europe. Then in Latin America, Argentina, unfortunately, has one of the highest in the world inflation rate right now. But we all have a different uh, inflation rate in different countries with different measures. And I think that uh, there's a lot of multilateral discourse that has been happening in the last decade. However, what we see now is a very local response to global threats that affect all of us. So the very personal contact with government and businesses and the working together is more important than ever. Uh, in order to assess these risks, we find for our business, for example, that it is very important to be on the spot, to talk to the people, to talk to the local government, to talk to businesses, to really understand what measures uh, will be taken in that specific area and region or country, because it will be different um, in country per country. Despite the fact, and I still uh, uh, hope, that the global efforts will continue and they're very important, but we cannot lose the focus of the very regional responses that are happening right now. I want to give also a note of uh, a very positive note for Latin America uh, by saying that the chances and opportunities to do business and to change uh, societies into and improve current um, structural issues remain intact. Actually, uh, some of the, I've chosen one example that particularly is going to happen right now is Chile, was on the 4th of September, we have a constitutional amendment and a vote, very important one. Uh, it is really touching uh, upon risks and threats, but also opportunities that many countries face. It is about education, about pension funds, about health systems, and uh, they are new, things coming up like parity between men and women that are supposed to be in the constitution, nature or, or the risk on, uh, on nature, and nature being seen as a legal entity by itself. Uh, the text is not really clear. There are many issues in the details, but I think that Chile has shown in very difficult times that they can respond by a democratic tool. And this is something quite unique and should be a lesson for the world as well. I hope 
And it's very important that uh, the amendments will be accepted on um, Sunday. Uh, but Latin America is here showing also that the response is not dictatorship, is not a military action, is not, but it is really a democratic response. And this is a strong message coming out of Latin America. And given also the history of Chile in the past. There are elections coming up in Brazil as well, very important one. Um, there is a question of what it will impact on Mercosur, whether yes or no again, we'll have a more regional response or a more uh, country by country response. It is an important elections and we will follow it, but we see democracy at work. And this is something that is very important in the continent, in the whole of Latin America. And I would also like to straight out a couple of business uh, uh, new ventures that have happened that we hadn't seen in a long time here before. For example, in Brazil, and I'm working in the fintech area, really in the tech area, Brazil is a pioneer. We have companies with new entrepreneurs uh, pumping up into fintech. They're going all the way to New York to get to stock exchanges. We have uh, it's a duo, uh, women and a man being together, having created companies that really brought it to a unicorn uh, company. And this is unique, it's fantastic, and it's not the only one. Many other countries follow uh, in Brazil. I can think of Colombia also being a very nice hotspot for tech, and Chile trying to go into tech as well, very much so. And it offers opportunities, many. I can speak of Mexico, where in a long time we hadn't seen a Mexican company having an acquisition of a Swiss company here, literally buying it out and coming in, and ownership of that Swiss company is now in Mexican hands, which is fantastic evolution. So we see that despite all of the risks and the global risks, we do have uh, positive trends in Latin America, and the resilience of Latin America has shown one again, once again by being flexible, positive, and being able to cope with a whole series of events and risks that are happening, but with a, with a big lot of experience and resilience. So I think Latin America has a lesson to give us as well, and we are very optimistic despite all of the risk for the Latin American region. And we will continue uh, to back Latin America and to respond to it, and I think that particularly the fact that we can still count on democratic levels and discussion and good partnership between government and businesses is of key essence for us to continue. With that, I would like to hand over and close with saying that Latin America offers opportunities, intact opportunities. It has the risks that we all face, some local ones, uh, but it is a continent that is dear to my heart, that is close to our business, and we look forward to having and expand more businesses there. With that, I would like to hand over to Thomas first, and I would like to thank you again and SGE for all the support of the Chamber, because without SGE in difficult times, we would not be here today. So also for me, very personally, for your personal effort, Thomas, and your commitment, thank you very much. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, for your kind words. I think you mentioned something in the end of your speech. Latin America is close to your heart. I'd say it's also close to my heart, but also close to the heart of all my colleagues at Switzerland Global Enterprise. And only a strong chamber and a good chamber and a connected business chamber is something which can really move and show results. And I think um, having today, being here together all around us with all these business people in the room is a proof of concept of what you have developed, Tatiana, over the past year. So congratulations to you. This, um, thank you. So, um, estimados embajadoras, embajadores, queridos colegas, estimados amigos de Latinoamérica, I'm delighted to be here today. I already said that in person for the Latin America Day and um, I think it's the 12th year of Latin America Day. And remember, we were at a different location where we started with you, Philip, and, and all the team. And look what we've, we've got to. And this is something, a good proof of um, being um, sustainable in, in terms of ideas and making it happen. I want to talk about three things today here.
first of all, Team Switzerland. Team Switzerland, all of us who are here today are part of this Team Switzerland in and for Latin America. What does that mean? It means that each one of your organizations, companies, representations are here to establish and maintain a good economic relation and to do business in both countries or within the whole interesting region. And together as this team, Switzerland, we must use synergies to help Swiss companies there entering the market or being already in the markets to promote business opportunities and to help them in difficult times. We have seen this over the past two years uh, with COVID and all the challenges we had with um, the pandemia. And we can say that Swiss companies, at least looking at the rearview mirror, are resilient and are made for business and have not abandoned the continent, but stayed there and kept investing. And I'll come to that point again later. With our Swiss business hubs of Switzerland Global Enterprise in Mexico, Brazil, and Chile, and the close cooperation with the bilateral chambers of commerce, our strategic allies and important allies, as well as with the Swiss representation of the embassies and also the embassies here in Switzerland, I think we can proudly say all together we are a strong team and we have a shared mission that Swiss companies interested in that market can look into this market are being held and supported by entering and also being successful there. Since the beginning of this year, together with our partner, we could support around 200 companies only for Latin America and for internationalization. If we put back the movie three to four years ago, this was around 50 or 40 due to the situation, as well as the uncertainties of these different markets. And today we can say we are back we're back in business. We're back with 200 inquiries of small and medium-sized companies interested in Latin America. Just as a point of reference, yearly we have 400 only for the US. So at least that's a good number from my point of view. And the support ranges for clarifying export technical questions, for discussing business opportunities, and for looking for, and for, looking for new business partners. And I'm really happy here that all the team Switzerland is present. We already you already mentioned that. We have all our um, Latin American chambers of commerce here in the room. And this was certainly a highlight for me this year to see everyone back in Switzerland, not only visiting companies, but learning about best practice sharing, learning about how we can better support Swiss companies on the way out and training these chambers to really hold up the flag in all these markets for our economy. The second point I wanted to make is on market development. Latin American economies, and we probably hear this more and more throughout this afternoon, you already mentioned this, uh, are, have been proven to be quite resilient. And this resilience is again needed in current times of ongoing pandemic, geopolitical tensions, war, resulting in unstable value chains and rising energy prices inflation, and a lot of uncertainty amongst everything else. This is the reality for our companies today, especially for small and medium-sized companies. And of course, all this has strong impact on Latin America, being highly independent in the world's economy. Nevertheless, our mission to support Swiss SMEs, we have been noticing positive developments. First of all, in our quarterly survey, SMEs, exporters, report that following the exceptional surge in Swiss exports last year, they expect to continue to grow. While Swiss exports to the world grew amongst average 12.4% from January to mid this year, export to several Latin American countries exceeded that average, so they were punching above their weight. For example, Ecuador plus 34%, Panama plus 32%, Chile plus 17%, Mexico plus 11, and many, many more, and we'll probably hear more about this later today. And then tapping into Latin America market, we see that companies, all of our companies surveyed, 11% of them say that Latin America has become more and more important to them. Why? Because we also see that due to the current economic downturn, as well as the war in Eastern Europe or in Ukraine and Russia, companies start looking at new markets or compensate what they are losing in other markets. So that's, for me, a positive sign that Latin America can be back and are, is back in the perception of these companies as a very good alternative 
and a ground where they can grow in the future. We also see more business trips happening. We also see that Brazil is on the top five of the most requested markets and that Mexico, for example, has become a strategic location and well-developed manufacturing facility next to Chile for diversifying products or doing trade with Asia. These all aspects which are important and relevant to our Swiss companies and we're proud to help them to understand that. And let me close by giving us a few success stories which have been compiled together with my colleague. For the first time, we have, we have run back a fact-finding mission from Chile here to Switzerland. We invited Swiss in, uh, innovation companies from Chile in the food and agri-tech field and they toured Switzerland to understand why Switzerland is so relevant in food agri-technology and an innovation in the food sector. So we could proudly show them what we are made of. We also run a new Swiss pavilion in Mexico with uh, almost 10 companies joining and exhibiting their chemical and uh, technology ecosystem. And of course, we have big companies who are experts in that field, but it's also the fabric of the small and medium-sized companies who support these, uh, this image and, and also exhibited their technology. And then closing in Brazil, where our team has been consulting many Swiss SMEs with partners, we see that the machinery and electronics sector, the MEM sector, one of the most important sectors for Switzerland, has been growing with founding subsidiaries and new companies from Switzerland entering there and putting investments into that market, despite all the challenges in entering Brazil. Let me conclude by saying all of this couldn't have been possible with the, without the team Switzerland. So we're jointly and actively promoted these business opportunities with all of you. We have been investing not only money, but also resources in identifying business opportunities. And here, Philip Nell has supported us greatly with his insights for all the markets, um, publishing studies for us in the uh, area of traceability, e-mobility in mining for Chile and Peru, business opportunities in the infrastructure field, and many, many more. And all these studies are made available to Swiss companies who are interested in looking into Latin America, and they can access this information and talk to us and look into the new perspectives there. So for me, my glass is always half full. I'm half Latin American, so I must be half uh, positive by, by default. I think Latin America offers fantastic opportunities for Swiss companies. They will succeed there in the future, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day with all of you uh, to hear more about that. Thank you very much, and enjoy your day. Gabriela and Thomas, for both your inspiring remarks. I now have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker. He is the head of advisory and products in the Americas at Bank Julius Baer, and will give us his appreciation of Latin America and the global recession. Please give a warm welcome to Esteban Polidura. Perfect, let me see before I start. Good, um, thank you very much, Tatiana. I was thinking of uh, an intro for today, and uh, I think I found a very good one. I was reading the other day that negative news flow, negative news in general, generate twice as much engagement in social media than positive news. Some statistics even show even worse numbers. No? When I read about this and when I think about this, I realize why we are so anxious, no? and in my case, at some point, even afraid of what can happen. During the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I hope I can change this for you. I hope I can give you a more balanced view of uh, what's uh, ahead of us. I hope I can give you also a good picture of how Latin America fits in this more balanced scenario that we have in Julius Baer. And finally, of course, I want to give you some ideas of how to protect your capital, your wealth, your, your, your money, how not only to preserve it, but to grow it. And I hope I can, I can, I can do that. And uh, of course, if you want to, uh, to, to listen to the takeaways, if you want to, to take a quick nap while I speak, the takeaways are very simple, no? The outlook is not that bad, first. Second, 
we have to take some risks, of course, measured risks, but we have to take some measured risks because the environment allows for that. And finally, we need to diversify because this kind of scenario that we are living in and this kind of uncertainty that we are, that we are experiencing every day is here to stay. So let me start with a big picture. When you take a look at this chart, of course, this is a, uh, this is very simple because you can see very quickly these bull and bear markets, which some take as a proxy of how the world economy behaves. Not the best proxy, but as a proxy. And when you see this, and if I were to ask you, where do you think we are now? Do you think we are still in a bull market or do you think we are in a bear market? Does anyone want to share the views? You think we changed to a bear market? I would, th I would think the same thing. Most experts believe we are still in a bull market, no? With a correction, just as the ones that you see there in some of the uh, uh, past bull markets, in one of those harsh corrections, but still in a secular bull market, in a trend going up, no? If this is the case, and if experts are not mistaken on, uh, about this, then of course, going forward, we need to adjust a little bit how we take decisions not to fall into the trap of being extra conservative, extra defensive, extra worried about what, what can happen. Otherwise, we can, we can lose opportunities. But of course, your, to your point, we are in a bear market. It's very easy to, 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 to go with that kind of conclusion because of what we are seeing. Now, let's speak about inflation because this is basically triggering all the uncertainty that we are seeing today. And inflation here, this is the US inflation because this is basically what everybody's looking at. You have the, uh, the, the July figure. And when you see this kind of inflation and, uh, and think about why we are experiencing right now this kind of inflation, there is really just one reason why we are experiencing this. W why do you think? It doesn't have to... It, it's not oil prices, no? It's not uh, food prices. Why do you think we are experiencing this abnormal inflation today? Do, do you remember COVID times? No. During COVID times, two years ago or so, the world economy was basically uh, going into a recession or went into a recession. And the way that countries responded to this was by injecting money, basically. All this stimuli that we heard about. Anyone remembers the figure? No, the figure is very difficult to remember because every day there was a different country announcing something else. And then you have to keep track of that and add everything. But do you have a rough idea of what that stimuli, global stimuli meant? Let me give you the number. It was of about 30 trillion US dollars. If anyone has the GDP of the US in mind, this is larger than the size of the US economy. So to bring back the world from a recession to growth, we had to inject the same amount of money that the US economy generates in a year. Probably we, do, we now don't even remember how the economy uh, uh, rebounded between April and May, June of uh, 2020. No, it was a V-shaped recovery basically because of all this money. And of course, with all this money injected in the economies, it is difficult not to see why we are now experiencing inflation. No, we, uh, th this, is, this is a natural outcome. But again, what we faced with COVID was something that uh, uh, nobody had faced in the past. Of course, all this talk about inflation is generating real anxiety about a new recession. Uh, and, and why? No, because basically what uh, investors are saying is, well, to contain this inflation, to contain these abnormal levels where prices are, 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 are trading, no, or basically the commodities are trading, uh, central banks need to slow down the economies. And, and, and the tool that central banks have, the main tool that central banks have, is of course to raise interest rates. But the fear is that not even the central banks, not even the Fed, with all these very bright individuals in there, knows 
how much to raise interest rates so as to lower inflation but not generate a recession. This is a very difficult task. If the Fed doesn't really know that, most of the central banks don't know that, and in general, nobody knows what is the right speed, what is the right intensity of rate hikes to avoid a recession. Today, if you were to look at where the market sets the probabilities of a global recession, the figure is at about 50%, 50-50, a coin toss, no? But this is generating anxiety again. This is where we are. Now, I think we are focusing too much on short-term inflation because this short-term inflation is slowly but surely coming down. You can see where oil prices are trading now, no, not 120, but below 100. You can see where some of the food prices are. You can see where some of the main drivers of the short-term inflation are right now. And, and basically, you can see how the next figures that we see from the Fed and from some of the other central banks should show inflation coming down. I don't know, and really nobody knows uh, by how much or how fast, but this should happen. But again, we are focusing too much on the short-term inflation. What we should be discussing, because this is really relevant for all of you, for all of you, no matter if you have 10 francs, 10 million francs in your account, for all of you business owners or for every, anybody that has to manage money, capital, what we should be discussing is where the long-term inflation is going to be. Because that will determine where, for example, investors will set their uh, return expectations. So if inflation is not going to be 2%, but it's going to be 4%, you now know that inflation, uh, sorry, that investors are probably going to ask for twice as much return as they used to ask for in the past. Now you know where you have to probably set your prices going forward. So this discussion about long-term inflation is key. And what I would add there is that Unfortunately, the world has changed in such a way that there are very powerful forces, you can see them in, in red, very powerful forces pushing prices up, pushing prices up. Let me give you one, and maybe uh, some of you in your own businesses or in your own uh, daily tasks, you have been feeling this. There is a global trend where the world is deglobalizing. This is even strange to say. We have been speaking about a, a globalization for such a long time that now speaking about a deglobalizing world is strange, but this is happening. This is happening and this really gathered pace because of COVID, because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, because of many reasons where companies now see that there, there is not really an advantage of having suppliers <coughs> in China, in India, in Latin America, all over the world, because this is generating a problem to the, uh, for them. They cannot really be sure that their inputs, that the raw materials will arrive at the correct time. No? We experienced this with COVID. So now they are looking for suppliers more regionally or even locally. You know, in Latin America, for a Latin America company, within Latin America, or if you're a Brazilian company in Brazil, if possible. If you're a Mexican company in Mexico, if possible. Now, when you hear this story, you can quickly conclude that if the pool of potential suppliers narrows, becomes smaller, then of course, these guys that remain in the pool gain pricing power. And this is a key force pushing prices up. And let me give you one last one. Energy transition. Many of you are too young to remember this, but I do remember this. Flat plasma screen TVs. When they appeared, nobody could pay them. You know, they, they, were, they were really just for billionaires at that time. Now you find them in the supermarket. Same thing with some of the technology around uh, uh, green energy. Today, it is still expensive, some of them, or, or, or a lot of this technology. It is still expensive. If you're in a country like the US or some countries in Europe where you have this need to switch to green technology now, you have to pay the price. And that generates inflation. 
So within the next 10 years, what we believe at Julius Baer is that the US inflation, let me speak about US inflation just because we have these numbers very fresh. The US inflation will set not at 2%, but probably between three and four, closer to 4%. And that changes everything. You know? That puts pressure uh, not only for the Fed, but for other central banks. Now the Fed has to decide how much to increase rates, how much, not, not only how much, but how fast, and then, uh, of course, with the potential risk of, uh, of, of making a policy mistake, of making a mistake. Uh, I can tell you we expect the Fed to hike rates by about 50 basis points in September, 25 basis points in November, and with that, the Fed should be over in terms of policy normalization. That should be it. That's already different from what you hear from other banks, even from some uh, Fed officials. I was reading this morning that some of them are speaking of about 4% rates next year. If we are not wrong, rates in the US should, uh, should uh, uh, remain at around 3.25. Why is this important? When we look, Julius Baer, when we look at past data, many, many years, many decades back, and we see what happened when the Fed increased rates by about 300 basis points, which would be the case this time, three percentage points or so, what happened? Did the US economy go into recession or did the US economy, uh, let's say, uh, weather down though that pressure fairly good? What do you think? Did the US economy with such rate hikes go into recession, yes or not? The answer is no. There was a soft landing. So this is, this is good evidence why we at Julius Baer believe there will be no recession, at least not in the next 12 months. There is no reason to believe this based on historic data. There is no reason to believe this will happen based on current data. Uh, but again, we are in a world that needs to sell bad news. Let me give you an example. Within the last couple of days, the US reported job figures, data. Were the figures bad or, or, or good? The figures were very good. A lot of jobs are there, no? But of course, we need to give this a twist to sell. And of course, and, and I read this today, you can open your phones while I speak in, in one of the main news sources. And the, and the headline is this, heated job market can generate a jumbo hike, no, a jumbo hike. When you attach the word jumbo to interest rate hikes, you of course fuel this fear about a recession. And this is again the world we are living in. And this is the world where Latin America has to operate. Now, what happens with Latin America? Latin America, so, has to, has to weather down a world where G GDP or economic growth is still positive, slowing down, but it is still positive, where some of the main partners, let's say the US and China, are struggling, each one with their own issues, one with a heated economy and the other one with a, 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 a switch uh, from a, a, an, an industrial economy to a consumer economy. But uh, Latin America, again, needs to, needs to find ways to move in this kind of environment and needs to keep growing. What I can say, and this goes in line with what's, what, uh, what was said before, is that Latin America continues to grow. You know? This year, Latin America as a region should grow at around 3%, two and a half to 3%. Next year, Latin America should grow at around 1% to 1.5%. But listen to my words, I keep saying grow, grow. I'm not saying shrink. No. Yes, some countries might see their economies a bit more pressure than others. I can think of, for example, Chile, which, which was mentioned. This year, Chile was benefited by copper prices going up very rapidly. We can think of Colombia. This year, Colombia was benefited by oil prices. So next year, for some of the countries in the region, the stories might not be the best. But as a region, the region continues to grow. As a region, like any other region in the world, except uh, uh, for some very 
particular cases. As a region, Latin America is also facing inflation pressures. This is something the region needs to adapt to. I was chatting right before uh, my, my, my participation about, about what Latin America can do. And I can already tell you a little bit about this. With respect to growth, there is not much Latin America can do. Latin America, this is like, a, a, you know, trying to move the Titanic, you know? If you, if you need to, to, to quickly uh, do a left corner or, or, or a right one, it's not going to be like if you were driving a speedboat. Same thing here. Latin America cannot do a lot to offset the slowdown in the global economy. It cannot do a lot to offset the inflationary pressures that we see worldwide. Because this, again, this is a, this is, these are global trends. But Latin America can do something about one of the main issues that global investors have with the region. What do you think is that issue? It is very particular to Latin America. No. The world politics is what I want to highlight. As a region, Latin America stands out for having, let's say, a very heated political environment across the board. You can think individually of the countries in the region, and we could speak probably for an hour regarding each of these countries, no? each one with very different uh, stories and, 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 and very different things that, that matter to investors. So again, I think for Latin America as a whole, uh, the conditions are set for it to continue growing, for it to continue uh, uh, controlling inflation, uh, for it to continue generating uh, employment and, and many of the things that we want to see. But the region has to pay attention to politics because uh, right now, politics uh, in, 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 in some countries more than in others is really creating uh, some, some sort of a, uh, let, let's say, a problem for uh, international funds to flow normally. People, investors in general, are very cautious about how to invest in the region. Third and final uh, topic that I wanted to address with you, how to, how to, how to invest, no? how to move money. And this, again, applies for companies or for individuals. Uh, you can really take a lot from what I will say. First of all, with this picture that I just shared with you, you can, of course, see why we, in Julius Baer, continue to believe that investors should be active, should be investing, you know? that investors should not be completely uh, uh, safeguarded in cash, for example. Why not? First, because with such high inflation rates, you are guaranteed to lose money if you are solely invested in cash. So when we think of fixed income, when we think of bonds, there is an opportunity to make money. Where is the opportunity? The opportunity probably is not in the safest kind of bonds, but in the next layer, let's say, on the bottom side of investment grade bonds or on the high end of, uh, of uh, speculative bonds, basically. There is an opportunity, there is an opportunity for you to make uh, four, five, six percent returns in US dollar terms, uh, and again, positive returns, I'm, I'm speaking, and with that to uh, at least shield your portfolio uh, partially this year and probably completely next year from the erosion that inflation brings along. So in fixed income, you can make money. In equities, the same. Equities are not expensive. Take a look at this blue line, and what you can see is that valuations are basically close to average levels. So the question is, how to invest money in equities? What we believe is that within equities, you should take more of a defensive positioning and choose those sectors that have not only strong companies, but companies that generate cash flow. You know? Uh, this might sound even logical, but remember that uh, we sometimes forget about these uh, very clear rules of thumb. So, 
focus on companies that generate cash flows, focus on companies that have a defensive business model, and focus on companies that can uh, keep selling under stressed environments. Which kind of companies are these ones that I'm speaking about? I'm not going to make this difficult for you. Swiss companies, Swiss companies. So for Latin American investors, investing a portion of the portfolio into Swiss companies is not only advisable, but makes sense on a risk return basis. No. Another idea, would any of you still invest in, let's, let's say, US IT companies? Do you think it makes sense to invest in US IT companies? Yes, <laughs> it makes sense. Some of them, and again, I'm speaking about some select names, but it makes sense because they, are continue, uh, they continue to generate cash flow faster than other companies in other industries. They continue to dominate their markets. These are companies uh, that have the benefits of very high entry barriers. So again, when you think of your portfolio, don't think, don't think in the current environment that you need to be extra defensive or, or extra cautious. There is an opportunity for you to combine some of these stories like Swiss equities, IT companies, and some other, and end up with a portfolio that, uh, that, uh, that allows your, your money to, to, to grow with time. Commodities, any of you would invest in commodities today after the rallies we saw during the last 12 months? What I would say is, according to our opinion, it's not necessary. No? It's not necessary because some of the commodities like copper or aluminum or steel already, already uh, uh, had the, the rallies we expected. And some others, like oil or natural gas, are too expensive. We expect, just to give you a rough idea, we expect oil to be at $75 in the next 12 months. We expect gas to be at roughly one-third the price where we see gas trading today. So commodities, not necessary, and in some of them, we have to be very careful. US dollar, would any of you invest in other currencies that are not the US dollar? Some, some of them, but you have to be careful because the US dollar, there is no reason for the US dollar to weaken at least in the short term. No reason. If the Fed continues to hike rates faster than the rest, let's think of the central bank in Europe. If the Fed continues to hike rates faster than the central bank, if, if inflation is not materially different between the two countries or the two regions, if, a, if a geopolitical risks are still out there and people need to safeguard their money, need to, need to really find a, a safe heaven, there is no reason for the US dollar to weaken. But again, I spoke about diversification. Think of how you can diversify your portfolio on a currency basis. Yes, with a strong tilt to the US dollar, but the Swiss franc has also to be there. And there are some other currencies that need to be there. Does the euro need to be there? Probably in the very short term, not. So this is my last slide, and it looks very complicated, but uh, anyway, what I want to convey with this slide is simply how we at Julius Baer would structure a portfolio. Focus on the middle part, which is a portfolio for someone that has a balanced risk profile. And what you can see is that we would say roughly half of the portfolio should be invested in equities, in stocks, half of the portfolio. You should have around 40% of the portfolio invested in bonds, in fixed income. And this is very important to me. Look at the number on top of all the figures. That which says liquidity, that is cash. The cash that we have in our bank account. What is the figure? The figure is 6%. So what I want to say is there is no need for you as an investor to have huge amounts of your wealth in cash because conditions right now are set in such a way that you can profit, you can extract more value from that cash than if it is sitting uh, in, in, a, in, a bank, in a bank account or, or, or in a very uh, safe bet. 
let me conclude because I would like to see if there are questions and, and try to answer them. Let me conclude with a, with a, uh, with a saying in Spanish that uh, probably all of you know, which is a río revuelto, ganancia de pescadores. No? A río revuelto, I don't know how to translate that. I'll, I'll think about this. A río revuelto, ganancia de pescadores. Of course, to make a profit in this current río revuelto, we cannot be hiding, no? We need to be fishing. And uh, that's the message I want to uh, for you to take with you. So, thank you. Any questions that I can help? Please. Hello. Thank you for your insights. Um, regarding the deglobalization, de I think it's more a diversification of markets than deglobalization. Mm -hmm. The companies are changing their strategies and uh, their equation of, of price range and utilities will show uh, where they locate in the future and where they will try to get their, uh, we call it in Spanish, insumos mm -hmm. to, to uh, make their production. Uh, regarding the, um, um, the soft landing and hard landing, depends on the region. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the United States of America won't have a hard landing. Probably Europe, the European Union will have a hard landing and we have a, will have a little of recession because uh, the economics uh, structure is different. And uh, China is uh, showing a different uh, policy regarding rates than the, the Western economies. They are uh, having a quantitative easing mm -hmm. policy. So I don't know uh, how ch if China has a big influence in financial markets or China is, uh, has its influence is on, on the trade and, and commodity structures. And the last question I would like to, to ask you is, uh, what about the currencies, uh, the bitcoins and the other currencies that have a, a lot of speculation on inside? No? Do you treat them uh, as a commodity or do you treat them as an investing opportunity? Thank you very much for the questions. and. Uh, let me just quickly say one idea, because to your point about diversification, whatever we are seeing, the bottom line is, I think this is great opportunity for Latin America, you know, because we can attract a lot of this uh, uh, business that was or has been handled by some other regions in the past. Um, you spoke about Europe. You are correct. Today, we are still not forecasting a recession in Europe, but when you take a look at our growth expectation for next year, GDP growth for Europe, it's 0.7%. So we are getting, getting very close to a, a, a point where it turns negative. So we have to be very careful about that. And of course, the way Europe manages to weather this uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, natural gas during the next few months will be, will be key. Uh, cryptocurrencies, ah, what a nightmare, no cryptocurrencies. What can I tell you? Well, I, I brought back this chart just to show you where cryptocurrencies would fall today in an investor's portfolio. It would be the last line, the one that says alternative investments. No, That is where cryptocurrencies would. Now, when you see the Julius Baer's suggestion about that, it's 6%. But at that line of a portfolio, but that line also includes private equity, private debt, hedge funds, gold, many other things. So when you think about cryptocurrencies, the bottom line is this. We at Julius Baer believe that still today, it's not necessary to make them part of your investment portfolio. Why? Because it's very difficult to really have a, an educated uh, opinion of where prices are going. You cannot value them like a, like a company stock. There are no cash flows that you can bring to present value and then value, uh, uh, get to a cryptocurrency price. You need to use other techniques, for example, technical analysis, which takes a look at charts. 
it's very difficult and, and uh, that market is really prone to speculation like no other. It is a market that enhances the return of a portfolio when things are going well. So if your outlook or anybody's outlook here is that things in the world will go well, probably making an investment in, in cryptocurrencies makes sense because it, it enhances the return of the portfolio. But it is the same thing to the downside. If, if things don't work well, it can be really a drag for portfolio performance. So I would say no need for you to invest in them, but my personal suggestion would be if you have a few francs that you can spare, definitely use them to play a little bit with this story because we need to learn. We all need to learn. And the same way that we think about going to the movies and we spend 100 francs or, or, or a book that we buy or a course that we take, think of that in the same way. We need to learn and if it means trading in some platform, a, a, a cryptocurrency, for you to, to engage with the story, place your bets, assess why you were wrong or right, definitely do it. I think that's, that's how mo most uh, institutional investors and family offices are doing this. Uh, they are moving slowly but surely towards adding cryptos in their, in their portfolios. Still today, not a lot. Any other question? Yes, uh, I have one. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, first thank of you. all. Uh, now, I'll talk to you later to see what I will do with my, <laughs> my saving account. <laughs> but I have two, two questions. Uh, one is, all your assumptions are, I see there's a lot of focus on the U.S. Mm -hmm. But I also see that China is getting stronger and stronger in Latin America. Yes. Uh, uh, so maybe we should, I would like to note, uh, from you, what's your assessment with the China factor in there? Uh, and the second is this deglobalization that you're talking. I, I see there's a, a change of the consumers mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we cannot talk about only opening you know, markets, reducing tariffs. Uh, we need to talk about a globalization that is inclusive, environmentally friendly, sustainable. And, 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 and that's what some countries are requiring also, small countries in Latin America to the big countries outside mm -hmm. of Latin America. I there was recently a publication in Times from my president that he's talking about giving uh, conditions to develop countries in order to be able to export raw materials, especially in the sustainable area. Uh, so what's your thoughts about this yeah. change of the consumers change of the, of, of, of the and, and also there's a factor that you can see it reflected. For example, when you, if you remember Davos 20, 30 years ago, the topic was trade, mm -hmm. investment, and nothing yeah. else. Nowadays, you talk about parity, gender equality, you talk about environment, like it, it, the trend is changing and companies have to change with that too. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah a of question course. I, Both very interesting. Let me first address China. So China, on the economic side, you correctly pointed out, China is one of the few countries out there that is lowering rates you know, to keep the economy from falling even faster. That alone is very, very, very difficult to, uh, to, to understand in the current environment. But of course, by lowering interest rates, you also hurt the, the currency. You no, know? So opportunities in China are not straightforward first. For Latin America, that means a partner that used to grow at 8 or 9% rates, now growing at 3, hopefully next year at 4%, so half of what it should grow. For China, growing at 4% is not enough. And for us in Latin America, having China growing at 4% is not good news. It, it doesn't generate the kind of business that we need as a region. So add to that the very... Uh, let's say, a blurry uh, political arena in China with the constant uh, changes on the, on the regulatory front. And therefore, you can see how, at least for the next few months, uh, probably China is going to be under pressure, which means for Latin America, there are no, no tailwinds from, from China. Uh, 
as far as uh, your your point of uh, uh, sustainability goes, I think you are completely right. L Latin America, maybe except from Mexico, which is very manufacturing oriented, but the rest of, man uh, of Latin America is very commodity oriented. And the commodities, of course, fall into all sorts of categories within the ESG parameters, clearly E, but also some uh, S and, and, and definitely G. So Latin America is really a, a key market for ESG parameters and criteria to, to, to take place, to be, uh, to be enforced. And uh, if Latin America does things right, uh, it, it can definitely stand out uh, worldwide. I see a lot of investors, especially the younger ones, the, the, the new generation, completely focused on doing ESG-aligned investments. They are not considering anything that is not aligned to their own purpose. And, uh, and again, if Latin America wants, wants to capture those flows, uh, we need to become ESG compliant uh, yesterday. You know? The trick going forward will be how we adapt to the different kind of streams that we see within the sustainability world. S responsible investments, uh, uh, social investments, no? impact investments, uh, sustainable investments. There are many type of things that we need to tackle and this is changing quickly. But I think the opportunity, uh, again, to stand out uh, worldwide uh, is, is really for Latin America as a region and uh, more than for any other region. I think we have one more. No, thank you. Um, I think you already answered in some way what I wanted to ask. But anyway, I, I, I'll insist. You mentioned... Uh, on, on, a more, on a more political uh, side, you said that investors were quite cautious because of the possibilities of uh, undermining the processes by the political environment in, in Latin America. But mm -hmm. since I have a memory, the political environment in Latin America has, has been quite vibrant and tense. And I think in nowadays is, is we can say, less tense than it was 20, 30 years uh, mm -hmm. before. So what would be for an investor a more or less reasonable political environment in order for him to have a st stimuli to, to, to invest? What, what would yeah. be that? Yeah, yeah. Because we have, a, I, say, I should say, there is a, a democratic process in every country. There is alternation in power. It's more or less peaceful. The debate is tense, but the, the, there is not a civil war or a dictatorship or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So w what would you think would be the, the, the more or less reasonable yeah. atmosphere that, uh, that they, that they want? Us? I think this is a great question because, in my view, really investors don't care a lot if we are seeing a right-wing political party ruling a country or a left-wing one. What they need is transparency and visibility. Of course, to place their bets, many of, many of these investors are putting billions of dollars for the next two decades. No? So they need transparency. They need rule of law. That's what they need. Let me put two examples here of situations where investors today don't feel comfortable. Chile. No? A new constitution is definitely something incredibly important because it can change the way a country behaves for the next two decades or so. So that is something that generates lack of transparency and visibility and where they feel unsure. The political environment in Brazil, maybe not so much because these are the known faces, no? And yes, one might spend more than the other, and this, but that's, I would say, that's not a big issue. Another example where investors have a little bit of an issue is Mexico, where you have an administration that has come with a very particular way of seeing things, no? And in that way, some of the long-term contracts, multi-decade concessions, have been canceled from one day to another. That's something they don't like, because they need at least to know that wherever I put my money, the rules are going to be followed, and I can have transparency of that. 
the political things I can, I can tackle, but not the lack of transparency and not different administration, administrations changing the rules every six years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esteban, for your very clear and concise presentation and for sharing your bank's outlook and strategy with us. We have a small token of appreciation for you. Martina, would you please Somebody give it knew to what Esteban? To give me, no? Somebody knew what Before to Before you leave, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Don't forget much. to give back your headset when you leave. Yes. Thank you. Ah, no. <laughs> then have the chocolates back. Ah, no. <laughs> Our next session is a panel discussion entitled From the COVID-19 Recovery to the Russia-Ukraine War, Impact on Swiss-Latin American Relations. I'm honored to welcome our panelists, Ambassador Mirko Giulietti from the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and Minister Hervé Lohr from SECO. The panel discussion will be moderated by Dr. Philipp Nell, Honorary Ambassador of LATCAM. Please give them a warm welcome. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Ambassador Mirko Giulietti and Minister Hervé Lohr this afternoon here in Zurich. Really, it's a great pleasure to be back uh, live. For now two years, we had been uh, holding this panel virtually. And uh, with such a beautiful auditorium, we are very, very pleased to be here with all of you this afternoon. We're going to cover some key political and economic aspects of Swiss relations with Latin America under the very complex situation of the past 12 months. COVID has been a huge shock for Latin America, erasing, for instance, more than 10 years of poverty eradication, putting job in jeopardy public finances, provoking falls in currencies, and delaying investments. In addition, the Russia-Ukraine war has strongly affected the world economy including Latin America. In that particular context, we're interested to assess how the Swiss government, also Swiss business, has during those times strengthened ties with Latin America and also contributed to alleviate hardship faced by the continent. Our discussion will focus first on the economic recovery following um, the very serious COVID crisis in Latin America, and then we will move on the implications of the Russia-Ukraine war on Swiss-Latin American relations. Uh, let me start first with the uh, COVID-19 recovery. Uh, as you may recall, during the COVID year in 2020, uh, Latin America's economy fell by an average of 6.2, 7.4%, uh, 7.4%. The year after went up 6.2%, 6.2%. This was led by Peru in particular with 13.5%, Chile 11.8%, Argentina 9.8%, and Colombia 9.5%. Uh, Brazil and Argentina had lower growth rate in 2021, 4.7% for Brazil and 58 for Mexico. Now, as I said, in some Latin American countries, uh, Decades of progress against poverty were erased during just a few months, a few months of uh, COVID crisis. And 30% uh, of the jobs that were lost in 2020 will not yet, have not yet been recovered uh, at the end of, uh, of last year. So let me first turn to Ambassador Giulietti. Uh, the Federal Council has a strategy, has a policy uh, strategy for 2023 period which encompasses the whole world, 
And in particular, I have retained in that policy strategy some key elements, which are prosperity in the world, sustainability, and digitalization. Uh, so I would like to explore with you a little bit now how these, these concepts this concept, um, have affected the, the objectives of the Swiss policy toward Latin America. So first, uh, how were these important objectives affected by the COVID crisis, and which Latin American countries were mostly affected? Uh, thank you, Philippe, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you to the LATCAM for the kind invitation. It's nice to be here physically this year and not once again uh, virtually. I, I feel a little bit more under pressure uh, uh, being here physically um, because I mean, most of you are, are in the business world. I'm not at all. And the kind of language that we use is quite a different one. I'm really very much impressed by the presentation from uh, the representative of Julius Baer. My language will be allow me not to be a very diplomatic one, although even if I have a, have a diplomat, if I am a diplomat. And also my thanks to my colleagues from, from Latin America that are here uh, today. On the objective of, the, of our foreign policy, Philippe Nell has mentioned we have a broad uh, um, foreign policy strategy covering the period 2020-2023 and we had to decline it in different regions. So the America division that they have the task to lead has been tasked to elaborate a uh, uh, America strategy. This America strategy encompasses for sure US and Canada and, and encompasses the Latin America. We have four major areas in, the, in our foreign policy strategy and we have taken the same four areas for, for Latin America. Peace and uh, freedom. This is one. The second one is prosperity, as Philip mentioned. Sustainability is the third one. And digitalization is the fourth one. Let's say that in terms of peace and human rights, we are allied with the most of Latin American countries in the major UN fora. We are allied in Geneva at the uh, Human Rights Council. We are allied in New York uh, at the General Assembly for the United Nations. We share the same values. And I would even say that since February 24th, this alliance with Latin American countries should be reinforced and should be even more deep than already is. With some Latin American countries, we have bilateral dialogue on human rights. With others, we don't. But again, we are on the same line. We share the same values on human rights, on rule of law that had been mentioned by the colleagues from the Judas Spear Bank, and on democracy. The world has changed on the 21st of February this year. And we have to work with the Latin American countries even closer than before. On prosperity, prosperity, again, is in our constitution. We have to work for the prosperity of Switzerland, but we think that the prosperity of Switzerland depends also on the prosperity of the rest of the world. And in, in, in my case, and, and Philippe, and Hervé case, we, it depends on, on, on the prosperity of, of the Americas. And in the prosperity, we have set a, a, a series of objectives that you can find in the uh, America strategy that you can find in the in our website of the Federal Department of, of Foreign Affairs. But just to mention some of them, Switzerland will contribute to improve the economic conditions in the partner countries and support Swiss company in needs-based and effective manner. You see two different dimensions. Contribute to improve economic conditions for, American, for Latin American countries and for Swiss companies. Thomas has mentioned from the SG, has mentioned Team Switzerland. We believe that we have to, to improve prosperity with you, with the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, with the Swiss uh, uh, companies. 
with certainly uh, uh, the SECO in Bern and so far and so on. It's not the official Switzerland alone that can improve the economic condition. We help to set the conditions, the legal condition, the legal framework and the political framework so that the private economy can do its job. On sustainability, sustainability is more than environment, much more than environment. You have certainly environment issues. One of them, and I recognize my colleague from Click Foundation, is the Article 6 from the Paris Agreement, where we have with some Latin American countries already a bilateral agreement, I think on, on, with Peru, we have with Dominica, the small island, in the, not the, Republic, the Dominican Republic, but the Dominica island. We, are, we have a uh, memorandum of understanding with Uruguay, and we are, uh, um, no, with Chile, I'm sorry, and we are uh, uh, negotiating with, uh, with Uruguay. Sustainability is also the social aspects of, uh, of, of development and the economic aspects of development. And under this uh, umbrella of sustainability, one of the objectives that you can find in our strategy is promote responsible business conduct. You, as a, as a, a, a business women and businessmen, you have a social responsibility. The motto of the World Economic Forum is entrepreneurship in public interests. And I would like to stress this because I know that most of you see the same See, see your business and the same. You are a social actor, and stakeholders are as much as important as shareholders. And this is also in our strategy. Digitalization is an important, a new um, objective of our foreign policy. It's a new uh, obje a, 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 a topic for every one of us. We have a new division, a digitalization division. We are just beginning now on. Um, on, on trying to define countries with, whom, with which we would like to cooperate in, in, this, in this area. Uh, we have uh, in the America certainly the US and, um, and Canada, and we have identified other countries like Brazil, Mexico, and Chile to be possible uh, uh, partners. My colleagues from the, from the digitalization uh, uh, division will get in touch with you in the next, in the next weeks. In, under this umbrella, again, digitalization is not only the technical aspects, but it's also the cyber security, and it's also our uh, uh, private space in the, in, in the cyber space. These are extremely important uh, aspects that we cannot Forget, so human rights in the cyberspace. Now the question was whether uh, our objectives have been affected by COVID. If the answer is, is yes, it would, it, would be, it would mean that our objectives were not well uh, uh, prepared. If the answer is no, it would mean that we are insensitive and heartless. I think that our objectives, I mean, the objectives are independent of COVID. The way to reach our objectives, maybe they have changed a little bit. Certainly in, in terms of economy, you know that better than I do. Uh, uh, the, the economy of Latin America has been very much uh, uh, affected by COVID. These, the, the, we, we had a V-curve, uh, and we are now the same level as two years ago in the economy, but the social consequences have been very hard, and inequalities have uh, increased. Uh, the uh, state debt has increased with the consequences, and consequences on social programs, on health programs, on infrastructure, and so forth and so on. So the what were already difficult, I wouldn't say difficult, but um, some, some major uh, uh, challenges in Latin America, these challenges are the same today, if not uh, even, even um, greater challenges because of COVID. So I say the objective, I would, I would think that the right one, we have to find new ways and new means to achieve these objectives. But they are objectives, um, I would say, midterm to, to 20, 20, 24, 25, 
And I don't think that in, in three or four years when we will revise our objective, they will change dramatically. If you see our strategy, you won't be surprised. Uh, there are things that we have done the last uh, 40 years and they will continue to be done with some, some adaptation. So the question whether we, it has been uh, uh, affected, yes, the way that we have to reach our objectives. The objective as such, they have not been affected for your information. The America strategy has been elaborated last year uh, when we were in the middle of, uh, of COVID. So um, we, haven't forget, we haven't forgotten COVID in, in our assessment and our analysis, but it told us COVID one day, hopefully very, very soon at the time, will be over. More or less, at least on health issue, it's over. Then we have now to deal with the dramatic consequences on, on social uh, life, on the e economic and even on environmental uh, sides of, of, um, of the crisis. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mirko. You showed us clearly that Switzerland has a foreign policy strategy with clear objectives on peace, prosperity, sustainability, and digitalization. These objectives have not changed with mm -hmm. COVID, but nevertheless, greater challenges are there, and these must be met, and therefore, Switzerland must constantly work with the various countries, with various committees that you have uh, on uh, human rights and other issues in order to um, move forward and to ease and therefore to move back to uh, a better situation for these, uh, for these countries. But it's important to say that the strategy is comprehensive and that the Swiss government is fully aware that the challenges are greater than they were before and that therefore all means are put in full force in order to, uh, to ease the situation. Now let me move to, um, to Minister Hervé Lor, to the economic side. Um, advanced economies are projected to come back to their pre-COVID you know, uh, GDP level uh, already by uh, the end of, of this year. Uh, emerging economies would go back to that in 2025, 2025 only. It's going to take more time. Um, for Latin America, low investment and uh, low productivity um, characterize the, the continent. Um, Swiss exporters are fully aware of uh, that, those difficulties. Uh, if you take 2019, we see that Swiss exports to Latin America uh, fell by a bit more than 3%. This was before COVID. In 2020, they fell again uh, by 14%. Uh, why they fell to the rest of the world by 4% only, 4%. Uh, and now in 2021, last year, the recovery to Latin America was 6% in exports, while it was 16 to the rest of the world. So here we see also a, a gap. So uh, let's look a little bit at this. Uh, um, we are in the Chamber of Commerce here, and uh, people are interested, and we are interested uh, in to see how you know, our export performance may, may, may come back, may get back. Um, now, how do you assess now the situation in 2021 referring to Swiss exports to Latin America. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to uh, everyone and thank you for the invitation. Uh, likewise, um, as uh, Mirko mentioned, um, we're a civil servant, uh, basically a trade diplomat, but, but not an economist like, like you are, Philippe. Um, I'd like to say that what I've heard uh, so far is quite encouraging for me because it's not like I was in another world. I was a bit afraid to come here today and he hear things from the private sector, where I would say we're in, in Bern, we are totally uh, somewhere, another place, which is not the case. And I think that's comforting. It's comforting to hear some positive note also on opportunities, and I think there are opportunities. There are quite a lot of challenge. They have been mentioned slightly at a different stage during the afternoon, uh, but overall, I think there are indeed opportunities in Latin America. And I'm, if I'm looking at the, uh, the, the Switzerland bilateral trade, export plus imports with Latin America and the Caribbean, rose by 8.4% in 2021. In absolute numbers, Swiss exports to Latin America amounted to 6.1 billion Swiss francs in 2021, and thereby constituted 1.7% of total Swiss exports in 2021. 
Uh, Swiss exports to the Kalak countries increased by 6% in 2021 after having dropped by 14.5% in 2020, which is a little bit this rebound and recovery we've been uh, discussing. Several countries with a very good performance can be highlighted. The countries which saw a significant increase in Swiss export were, for example, Bolivia, plus 71%, Guatemala, plus 60%, Dominican Republic plus 33%, Honduras plus 33%, or Paraguay plus 21%. For larger economies, the recovery of a Swiss export is less spectacular, but present, but it is visible almost everywhere. For instance, Argentina uh, plus 13%, Mexico plus 10%, Colombia plus 9%, and Brazil plus 3%. The latest figures for 2022 show that this rebound is still continuing, despite all the global economic upheavals we have been mentioning, including, including the, the war in the Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I, I, I think it's very important to point that uh, 2021 was a, a recovery year in Swiss exports, and that in 2022, this recovery has been strengthened and even seriously strengthened. Uh, if you take uh, Switzerland, uh, Latin America for 2022, January to July, we have a plus 11%, plus 11, plus 11, while we have only plus 2% with Asia, plus two with Asia, including China, plus two. Yeah. We have 11 with Latin America. And I was telling the ambassador of uh, Argentina just a few minutes ago, I had some good news for him, because uh, Argentina is number one now, uh, among the important economies in Latin America for, for this year, with a plus 16% of Swiss exports growth to Argentina. Uh, last year, Argentina was also number one, plus 13. And these are big numbers. You know, it's, it's more than 500 million, just not small numbers. So these numbers mean really something. Uh, Mexico is now plus 15% this year, 15%. It was 10 last year, it's 15 this year. And uh, Brazil is plus 12, 12. That's big, big numbers. We had only four last year. We have, we have now, we have only two last year, now we have 12, 12 with Brazil. And uh, with, uh, with Mexico, also, the, uh, the, the numbers are very good. I just sold plus 15%. So this all shows, you know, that uh, the optimism that was brought forward a few minutes ago by some other speakers is kind of getting confirmed here, saying, well, look, you know, Latin America, this is, you know, uh, 500 million or so of consumers of a market, and in this market, there are always opportunities and new opportunities coming up. And here the data for this year is really uh, astonishing what we see, uh, and it's going certainly to continue for the, for the rest of the year. Now, if we turn to investments, what can you tell us about Swiss investments now in Latin America in the past month? So, in well, I think maybe the first remark I would say on, on this one is and I, I have the impression that I heard that somehow as well in the presentation uh, of Esther, is uh, we've been discussing geopolitical issues uh, lately. We've been uh, having the issue of some years ago and still ongoing China and the US, trade war difficulties. Uh, we have uh, the pandemic behind us. We hope it's behind us. Uh, we, have, uh, we have had, of course, now the, uh, the aggression of Russia in Ukraine. And that brings about quite a number of uncertainties at geopolitical level, and especially in certain regions. And it will be interesting to see in a year from now where these investments are going to be reallocated. And probably there is a chance at some point for Latin America in, in, in this story. Looking down to the uh, numbers, Latin America and the Caribbean accounted last year for two point, uh, sorry, in 2020, for 2.1% of the overall Swiss FDI stock with a total of 30.7 billion Swiss francs, together with FDI in offshore financial centers of 113.5 billion Swiss francs. The subcontinent's share constituted 9.9% of the total Swiss FDI stock, respectively 144 billion Swiss francs. With 8 billion Swiss francs, Brazil attracts the biggest share of Swiss FDIs, uh, followed by Mexico with 5.6 billion and Colombia with 4.6 billion Swiss francs. As a matter of comparison, Asia accounted for Swiss FDI of 
46 billion Swiss francs with most in Singapore, 32.5 billion, China, 25.2 billion, Japan, 22 billion, South Korea, 20 billion, and Hong Kong, still 15.5. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to put a footnote here in this data of 12, 13 billion. If you take only Nestle in Brazil, it's maybe 20, 30 billion dollars investment, quite clear. So this data is data which is reported to the Swiss National Bank every year by companies on book values, good book values. But uh, the relationship between countries, I believe, is, uh, can be assessed, but the, uh, the numbers as such must be considered very carefully. What is better is to look at, for instance, the number of jobs. We have also job numbers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which give us an idea of uh, Swiss presence in these uh, various countries. But the Swiss presence in Latin America is very strong in terms of foreign investment. It's very, very strong with uh, uh, the key uh, large uh, Swiss uh, companies uh, present uh, all around the, uh, the world. And in which sector would you see most potential now uh, in Latin America for Swiss uh, companies? Uh? Well, there is certainly agri-tech, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, in, in Chile and Brazil and Argentina. That's certainly a, a topic. Clean tech is emerging. There is a big cluster in Switzerland, and uh, we should uh, keep an eye on this. And I would say they're almost everywhere. Brazil is certainly a place. Uh, Chile is certainly a place. Colombia is certainly a place. Um, these are definitely sectors. Every sector, basically, where you, you have an added value when it comes to uh, clean energy, clean tech, sustainable products, sustainable industry, et cetera, uh, that's a good future, I would say, for, uh, for Latin America. I'm not saying by that that all other sectors are not going to be the traditional ones, are not going to be uh, you know, present in, in, in Latin America by all means. But what I'm saying is that's where certainly things are going potentially to happen and there, is, there are opportunities, which goes somehow again in the uh, foreign policy strategy that Mirko was mentioning and probably as well in the foreign economic uh, policy mm -hmm. strategy that SECO has been uh, publicizing last year. Um, now, uh, if you look at uh, challenges like, like Mercosur, the FTA, for example, Sustainability is definitely playing a, a, an extremely important role. Uh, yes, certainly, and I can only support uh, the, uh, in, the uh, importance of the Swiss uh, sector in terms of clean tech. Clean tech, I've been uh, conducting uh, uh, studies, reports uh, for SGE uh, with Argentina and Peru and the Bilateral Chamber of Commerce, which are here present. And uh, what we have seen, what really um, kind of uh, what, what I found uh, very inspiring is that um, when I talked to the clean tech companies in Switzerland, and uh, I, I selected eight categories of, for instance, you have um, sustainable water management, sustainable mobility, energy efficiency, renewable energies, sustainable mining, and so on, eight categories. These, these Swiss SMEs were all interested to grow and to go abroad and to uh, be uh, become aware of opportunities uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, so uh, there is a very positive uh, uh, note here to, to point, and therefore there will be some uh, opportunities. Uh, now let's turn to the second topic uh, for this afternoon, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, Mirko, you already talked about peace beforehand, so uh, some of that will already be, be, be covered by, by you. Uh, we have seen that Latin America has been strongly affected by a lack of fertilizers, lack of fertilizers, which also led to some social problems, for instance, in, uh, in Peru and so on. Because without fertilizer, what do you want to do? Huh? If you are a small or medium-sized farmer, the situation was critical in Peru in particular earlier this year. Um, therefore, there have been some, uh, uh, without speaking about inflation, uh, pressure, inflationary pressures linked to that. Um, so the um, foreign policy strategy also encompasses peace, security. Um, would you like to add something? Would you like to add something on also uh, some um, peace situations in Latin America in which Switzerland has been uh, quite active uh, over, the past, uh, over the past years? Uh, we think about, uh, we think about uh, Colombia, we may also think about um, 
a Marshall Plan for Central America. This has been already proposed quite a few times. We are still waiting really for the United States to take the initiative on that because it is in their, in their backyard, but this has not yet been the case. Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Again, the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, because it's what's happening, it's not a crisis in Ukraine, it's a Russia invasion in Ukraine, has deeply changed the world that we live in. Um, since 70 years, we have a UN charter, which states very clearly what are the responsibilities of every state, particularly the states, the member states of the Security Council, the permanent member states of the Security Council. And Russia is one permanent member of the Security Council and has bluntly broken the UN Charter. This means that Switzerland and Europe, North America, South America, Latin America, we are democracies. We do believe in democracies. We do believe in human rights. We do believe in rule of law. We have collectively insist in New York, in our bilateral discussions with the other countries, that these three are the value of the democracy. It's not in the Charter, I have to admit it. But we do believe in the Charter of the United Nations. And these are the basis of the international relationship. Now, um, again, I said we consider we are deeply uh, uh, engaged with Latin American countries in the international fora. We have to continue to be engaged with the Latin American countries in the, region, in the international fora to de strongly defend these values contained in the UN Charter. This is a, is a, is a chapeau. Now, the Swiss engagement in peace, we have, um, we have a, a, a human rights and peace division uh, which supports many and, and different uh, um, uh, mediation processes and different peace processes. I don't go into details, but in Latin America, uh, Switzerland has been working now for more than 20 years in Colombia, supporting at the very beginning the negotiations between FARC and the government of Colombia. You know that the Colombia, the FARC, the government and the FARC, they uh, signed uh, an agreement in 2016. We're in the implementation phase. Switzerland supported the implementation phase in different ways. We are engaged in locally in promoting um, discussion and possibilities or discussion fora between local authorities and populations. This round table, the idea is that authorities and population can see where the problems are and collectively they can find a solution for this problem. Switzerland is supporting the very broad concept of dealing with the past. In a case of um, uh, wars, civil wars or international wars. When you sign a peace agreement, you have to certainly implement it, but then you have all these social amertume. You have to, to guarantee the victims of the conflict that there will, that there will be, that they have some rights. They have the right to be, they have the right to justice, they have the right to be, they have the right to knowledge, to know what's, what, what went on during a civil war. They have the right to justice, right to reparation, and as the guarantee of no, of no repetition. Switzerland has a strong um, uh, uh, um, knowledge on this dealing with the past concept. We are supporting very much the Colombian authorities and particularly the Commission on Commission para la Verdad, which is one of the three um, body that has been created with the, with the peace agreement in Colombia, uh, the special jurisdiction for peace. The, the Commission para la Verdad and the Unidad de Búsqueda para Personas Desaparecidas. Switzerland is supporting this. And then 
We have, uh, with a new government, uh, Petro, the President Petro, is ready to re-engage with the ELN to uh, um, peace uh, uh, conversation. Switzerland stands ready to mediate or to support a, a team of mediators, country of mediators. We are kind of a, a group of friends. Um, and uh, when both the government and the ELN um, uh, ask us to intervene, we, would, we are ready to do it. Also in Venezuela, we are not among the big players um, uh, which underpin the discussion that are taking place in Mexico, but we have some programs in Venezuela itself. In the, media in the mediation uh, 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 jargon, you have a track one with government, track two is with local authorities, track three is social, uh, uh, um, so, uh, civil society and, and local authorities, where we would say we have some, I won't even say mediation, but we, have, we facilitate some discussion, uh, informal discussion at, at local levels, and even uh, uh, among opposition, uh, civil society, uh, international organization, and government. Very low key, um, but we, we're doing it. So this is our efforts at the moment in, in Latin America to promote peace. What a Marshall Plan for, Latin, for Central America? You mentioned uh, the US, uh, certainly they have a lot of interest in Central America, instead we, don't, we do not have. Presently we have, um, uh, our uh, development cooperation is present working in Nicaragua and Honduras. As you may know, um, the parliament decided to to conclude all the bilateral uh, cooperation in Latin America by end of 24. So it means that our two offices in Nicaragua and Tegucigalpa will, are finishing now the projects they are implementing by 2024, and our presence in Central America will be a uh, diplomatic and political presence with no uh, cooperation programs anymore, no bilateral cooperation anymore. We have global programs in terms of water, in terms of climate change, and we still have, but I don't have the exact figures, but Switzerland is still funding a project at the World Bank or the um, Inter-American Development Bank or other UN funds for 600 millions a year, not only for Latin America, but globally. And it's very difficult from these funds to know what's going to Latin America and what's going to Asia or to Africa. But our presence will, will continue, but in, an, in, in a, let's say, in, in another form. Marshall Plan, it's my understanding, Mexico and the, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, they have set up a plan. It's my, if I do remember correctly, more or less 40 billion US dollars for the next for five years, I don't know where you stand with implementation. At the time in 2019, when the plan was elaborated, they promised to many different uh, uh, um, donor countries that would, would have been invited to a big uh, 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 conference. I never saw the invitation. I think that the conference uh, has never taken place. But anyway, we are ready to support, not, uh, not uh, um, uh, bilaterally, but as I said, from 2025 on in multilateral funds. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, your, your uh, statement was very useful for us because they showed us that indeed uh, Switzerland uh, follows carefully and is active uh, in Latin America in the areas where uh, there has been conflict, where there are conflict, where there is still amertume, and therefore still much to do in order to bring uh, a peaceful uh, times to, uh, to these uh, societies. And uh, now let me turn to, uh, to Hervé. Uh, um, the presentation from Julius Baer told us that uh, we might or we might not get into a recession, but nevertheless, uh, high interest rates mean, uh, mean something, mean something for the economy. <laughs> we see the stock market, how it reacts right now, uh, in only anticipating uh, the next uh, hike uh, from the Federal Reserve which come in the middle of, uh, 
of, of September. And uh, this has consequences from all around the world, all around the world. And we have seen with COVID, what we see with the uh, Russia-Ukraine war is that the world economy is affected. It has an impact on world economy growth and therefore also on Latin America. And for Latin America, we discussed prosperity earlier this afternoon mm -hmm. and prosperity. What means prosperity? Well, you need, you need education, health, mm -hmm. and jobs. You need jobs. And jobs, it is your part. Jobs <laughs> is... <laughs> Job is policy, policy making, uh, tools by which uh, also the Swiss government could strengthen ties with uh, these Latin American countries in order to bring more investment and more trade. So let's first start with the uh, uh, free trade agreement between uh, EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, and Mercosur, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay. The negotiation was concluded in substance in August 2019, these are three years ago. So where do we stand now? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we stand two years after the pandemic, <laughs> I guess. That's, that's a fair one now. And uh, I would say that, that certainly th there has been work during these couple of years. Um, there has been work on the legal scrubbing, which for lawyers in the room means that they understand that we are very close to concluding. Uh, that was lengthy because nobody could see physically the other party and go over some still open sensitive questions. That's fair to say too. I think there are some elements when you look uh, in rules of origin, uh, you've been uh, working on rules of origin, uh, on cumulation, that's still, uh, that's still a topic. Uh, I'm not going into the detail. There are several small topics. The main probably big issue, and I alluded to that already, and you've been hearing me in other venues over this uh, issue, is sustainability. Uh, I, I definitely think that for uh, Switzerland, but we are not the only one here in Europe, uh, our big wake-up call came last year when we had the referendum against the free trade agreement with Indonesia, which with a very narrow positive vote could be approved by the people. It's, I think it was 51.4 or 0.6% of uh, the Swiss uh, population, voter population, that said yes to that agreement. And if you consider an agreement, and, and the whole discussion turned around the palm oil, and whether or not palm oil is or not sustainable. And uh, we have seen then that, of course, the, um, the discussion now with, uh, with Mercosur is turning around uh, environmental issues, is turning, of course, uh, around the Amazona questions, and is turning around um, sustainable production of agricult agricultural products. Um, it, I'm not saying that because we are three years down the discussion after 2019. I'm just saying that because people have been increasingly more aware on the population living in a direct democracy in Switzerland, and we have to weather that properly. So my expectation is that within uh, the next months is we will have a discussion at the heads level of the negotiators, not at the expert level, to try and to reassess this situation three years down the road and to uh, seek ways and means to, uh, to make head, uh, headways here. We are still, and I have to say that, absolutely convinced that we have to complete that agreement as soon as possible. As soon as possible, yeah. It takes two to tango, and you know, if you look at the... Eight, eight in this case. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for yes, a very nice tango. I look forward That's to more it. of a French farandole than, yeah, <laughs> than yeah, a tango. Yeah. <laughs> but looking also at the Latin American side, one should note that uh, nowadays uh, Argentina restricts imports with prohibitions, with quotas, and with uh, justifications for some imports despite the fact of a big increase in Swiss exports, very nice for us, but also that uh, in case that uh, Mr. Lula would be elected as president of uh, Brazil uh, in October, we have seen that the policies that he has been now advocating are more concentrated toward Mercosur and Latin America, <laughs> Latin American uh, um, uh, integration and Latin American uh, cooperation. And you know, this, is, this is the way it happens. Now we see also, for instance, with Joe Biden, his administration is not interested in free trade agreement. No, not at all, even with the UK. They started, 
it's all stopped and uh, it will not be renewed because of the interest of a part, political party of uh, Mr. Mr. Biden. So we have also to live with these realities you know, on both sides. We have on our side and they have also on their side their reality. Uh, so I think we're going to have some very moderate optimism going out tonight uh, <laughs> of this room uh, re referring to uh, this uh, free trade uh, uh, agreement. And now as time is moving, I think we could come to uh, the audience and uh, the audience could address us some questions. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It works. It works, okay. Uh, now, in this case, uh, Switzerland is a net importer of food uh, products and agricultural products and have a strong manufacturing uh, sector. So uh, I think it is, Switzerland is very complementary with uh, Latin American countries that are agriculture, uh, commodity, export oriented. Nevertheless, there is also high tariffs on and quota imports on a big amount of uh, products, mostly on also on seasonal uh, tariffs on fruits and, uh, and uh, other vegetable products. So, uh, I mean, uh, every country has its protection. I know that Switzerland uh, it has a function, multifunctionality regarding um, agriculture, and it's beautiful when I go uh, Swiss highways and see the cows uh, <laughs> lying on the mountains, grassing on the mountains, it's, it's great. But uh, I don't know if there is any idea in the future to change these uh, trade barriers that don't permit or uh, uh, don't allow our exporters to uh, have an access uh, to Swiss markets and for the agricultural products? Well, thank you for that question. I mean, you are just hitting exactly where the, uh, not the issue is, but one of the biggest issues are. I would say that if you look at the, the agricultural policy of Switzerland the last 40 years, that you will see that consistently there is less surface for agricultural sector, and there are less families depending on the primary sector. So the question is, what, not what we are doing, but at what pass we can do that politically in Switzerland, considering the majority relation you will find in Parliament, <coughs> and probably as well a certain sensitiveness towards the agricultural sector still in the population. I think that would be the most educated political answer I can give you and offer you on, 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 on that. That means that you have uh, certainly at the Department of Economics people that are uh, dedicated to work on this and have been dedicated for decades on working on this. But as you know, that's, and it's not only in Switzerland, look at, if we talk the negotiation of Mercosur and the European Union, look at the position of France. I would just like to add that uh, following COVID-19 with protective equipment we didn't have, following the Ukraine war with our dependence on gas, <coughs> I'm critical now, which is 100%, implies that in the population here too, people are very sensitive in terms of having still some food being produced here in case of another shock which may come and uh, seeing what happens today in Pakistan, we really do not know where we are going tomorrow. Yeah, I think Philip is alluding, of course, at the, uh, at the disruptivity uh, issues that we've been facing for now a couple of years uh, in the global value chains. Uh, I think uh, that Gabriella, in her uh, introductory remarks, was mentioning the fact that uh, companies are, of course, uh, if they are not blind, I mean, exposed company at the, uh, at the foreign concurrence, they're slowly uh, making uh, check and balances and risk management, whether they have to integrate some part of their productions or not. The other, the other strategy is, is, of course, to go for the diversification that was mentioned too uh, in the discussion, I think, uh, a number of times today. Um, yeah, 
I think that I was waiting for uh, I was waiting for quite some time for the big word uh, China. It, it took some time to come. I just noticed, but but I think we we mentioned the U.S. Of course, that is important for us. Uh, we mentioned the European Union that is directly important to us, and we certainly have to mention China that is still important for, for Switzerland. And I think that this kind of uh, reflections are made at the board of director levels of many companies nowadays, not only in Switzerland, but in Europe, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, unfortunately, our time is off, so that uh, uh, we are going to go to the next uh, speaker's presentation. That's right. <laughs> Time is up. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mirko Giulietti and Minister Hervé Lohr, for providing a well-rounded picture and transparent appraisal of the current situation. And thank you, Philippe, for preparing and moderating this discussion as thoroughly as usual. We also have a small gift for you, which Elena will present. Please give our panel another round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we are running a little bit late, as you might have noticed. But as announced before, we're very happy that the representatives of 11 chambers from Latin America traveled all the way to Switzerland and are here today. I now ask all of them to join me here on stage in the right order. Starting from north to south as... Hmm? You are the first one. Yeah. Each one of you will have the opportunity to introduce yourself and your chamber during two minutes. And if one of you goes over the assigned time, there will be a buzzer. Adriano is kind enough to be the buzzer man. And as soon as you are ready, I would say, let's go. And I have the sensitive task to move the slides. So I will just go down. Perfect, let's start. I feel like in a startup competition. <laughs> So my name is Christian Mitchell. I'm the executive director at the Swiss-Mexican Chamber of Commerce and Industry based in Mexico City. We have been operating since 2016, so it's going to be our sixth anniversary this year. Uh, we have 75 members, only companies, uh, and our main activities are our working groups. It's meetings between business executives when, where they can talk about human resources, finance and tax, sustainability and ESG, and seven other topics. Uh, we organize conferences and events on doing business in Mexico. Uh, for example, how the recent reforms or public policies affect the operations of Swiss companies. And with a strong focus on government affairs and public relations. Um, because of nearshoring, which is localizing production close to the main markets, Mexico now has a huge potential. Uh, we have seen Swiss investment grown. Uh, either existing companies are doing expansions of their uh, production plants, but also new companies are either relocalizing from, from Asia to Mexico uh, or coming directly to, to Mexico from Switzerland. Our main uh, sectors are advanced manufacturing, which includes automotive and aerospace industries, infrastructure and energy, and also medical technologies. Because of that, uh, we opened this year two new offices. So I'm in the main one in Mexico City, but now we have an office in Querétaro, which uh, Mr. Hervé Lor was had the pleasure to inaugurate in March, and a new office in Monterrey, close to the US border, which was inaugurated by the ambas Swiss ambassador in May. You can find my contact information here, and it will be a pleasure to get in touch with you in the networking session. And thank you very much, uh, LATCAM, 
uh, uh, Latcam, sorry, is the Tatiana <laughs> here, and uh, SGE also for enabling uh, us, uh, the directors of the Swiss Chambers, to, to travel to Switzerland. So thank you very much, and I hope I'm in time. <laughs> Muy buenas tardes, uh, hola a todos. Uh, I'm Jessica Lepke from the Swiss Panamanian Chamber of Commerce. I'm the executive director. Normally, the reaction I, that I get when I tell that I'm from Panama is, oh, and this just happened the day before yesterday when we visited a SME here in Switzerland. So perhaps I can surprise you with some facts about Panama because already around more than or around 100 in Swiss companies or Swiss entrepreneurs are already present on that market. And 160 multinationals from all over the world, of which 10% are Swiss companies, use Panama as a business hub for the region. Why is this so? It's quite simple. Panama has a dollarized economy, it offers a stable political situation, and if you think of sending employees there, I think you want everyone to be secure there, so it is a very secure um, country compared to the neighboring uh, countries, sorry to say that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and on top also the health system is very good, what I can from tell you from my own experience. But business-wise I know everyone wants to do business, but what we have there is the Panama Canal, um, where 6% of all the world trade is shipped through. Um, besides, we have um, the biggest free trade zone there on the Western Hemisphere, where a lot of trade is also doing. And um, yeah, you also have the airport to Cumin, which is also very important if you think of traveling between very, um, various countries. So it connects, I think, more than 40 countries all over the world. So I would be very glad to have some conversation and give you more information on the chamber um, because, yeah, that's why I'm here for. Thank you very much. My presentation is in Spanish because my English doesn't work very well. Entonces, espero que me entiendan. Pero la Cámara Venezolana fue fundada en 1979, tenemos 43 años, ayudando a las empresas suizas que todavía están en Venezuela, que creen en Venezuela, y tenemos actualmente 46 miembros, de las cuales 17 son compañías suizas como Nestlé, Novarti, KPMG y este Grupo Pharma. Y también tenemos importantes empresas en el sector bancario venezolanas, que son... Los, los, ban los principales bancos en Venezuela. Eh, la inversión que tenemos actualmente en Venezuela, información pública hasta el año 2020, es de un millón de francos sui eh, franco suizos y las principales industrias son alimentos, como lo comenté, Nestlé, Farma y servicios financieros. Este, en Venezuela tenemos algo muy, muy especial, que tenemos el Instituto Henry Pitier, que el señor Neil puso la primera piedra junto a nuestra directora hace 10 años, si no me equivoco. Ese instituto ha sido bandera en Venezuela porque ayudaba a gente humilde, a gente pobre, que lo han sacado de la pobreza y han, se han convertido en técnicos, electricistas, mecánicos, y eso es un, un, un apoyo, un aporte que hace Venezuela a, la, sociedad, a la, la Cámara Suiza, a la sociedad junto a la Alianza para el Conocimiento. Eso es lo que hacemos en Venezuela con las empresas suizas y todo lo relacionado con, con lo, las cámaras de comercio. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Silvia Gutierrez. I'm the executive director of the Swiss Chamber of Commerce in Colombia. Um, the, the, the chamber was founded in 1974. I've been uh, working for 21 years over there. So my heart and my watch and every my mindset is all Swiss by now after 20 years. Our uh, main activities, of course, are the, prom the commercial promotions. We work alone with SGE. Um, we do marketing studies and five finding missions and everything we could uh, just to help uh, Swiss companies to land into Colombia in a better way. Uh, we have 50 members uh, with an investment on 1,000 and 10,000 million francs uh, last year. And um, having in mind that it's not a very big uh, number of companies, uh, they employ something like 
12,000 um, jobs, direct jobs, which is quite a, a big figure. Um, of course, uh, as you know, uh, our uh, on my country is uh, still behind on infrastructure uh, things. So this is a, a target still, no matter what uh, the new government or the last uh, government uh, was doing. Um, that is always an issue. So infrastructure is always a main target for all the governments uh, that are on, on the power. Also health, pharmaceutical, and machinery, um, Swiss items are very well known, are very well appreciated. So we help SMS uh, to, to land into, into Colombia. Um, still, we, we have a new government, as you know. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a lot of expectations, as you know, but I think it's uh, worth to know, and uh, we are happy to help you out. Uh, so come to Colombia and be that part of Switzerland team. I have my notes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sofia Almeida. I am a president of Swiss Ecuadorian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Swiss Cham Ecuador was incorporated in, on July 16, 2020, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it, um, it has uh, 20, uh, 24 active members and three uh, donoring members who represent the most important sectors of the Swiss uh, business community in Ecuador, including pharmaceutical, construction, machinery, insurance, and food companies. The Chamber mission uh, is to promote commercial relations between Switzerland and Ecuador, of course, sharing the Swiss philosophy in the way of doing business and supporting these members in activation uh, to the Ecuadorian economy. To, the, to this end, the Chamber has focused its activities on consulting and networking, compliance, ethic, and transparency, training, tra sorry, trainings and dual education, and holding meetings with the companies to encourage and promote corporate social responsibility. The Swiss business community in Ecuador is made up uh, of more than uh, 80 companies and entrepreneurs um, who in the year 2020 investment uh, more than 282 million Swiss francs in Ecuador. Switzerland is currently the seventh and most important European investor in the country. So I would like to invite, to, uh, invite to you to get to know the Swiss, uh, Swiss Cham Ecuador and continue promoting integral ethical uh, long-term relations in between our countries. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Corinne Schirmer from the Swiss Cham Peru. I'm almost all my life in Peru and more than 20 years at the chamber. So um, I have well, a lot of experience and I hope I can talk to you a little bit later. We were founded in 1952, so we are 70 years this year, so we're going to have a big party. You're all invited <laughs> 1st of December. Um, we have 183 members. They were a little bit more before the pandemic. And there are about 64 Swiss companies, and we're working very hard on mining, medtech, now clean tech, and sure infrastructure. And our main activities are uh, the business, create the business opportunities for all, for the market, for all the companies, and organization of the Swiss pavilion. We're gonna have a Swiss pavilion in Perumin in two weeks, the second one with more than 22 companies. And well, the investment, it's not so high at the moment about the political situation and, and also the COVID. So it's 984 millions. And well, we're doing our best. We have a great team. We work together with the embassy, with SECO, with DEDSA. And we are always at your disposal, at your service. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Before I start my presentation, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mariana Badra. I am the executive director in the, of the Swiss Brazilian Chamber of Commerce um, since January. But I started my journey in the chamber 10 years ago when I was responsible for organizing the corporate events. Uh, here is our chamber at a glance. Um, the chamber is 77 years old and it was founded in 1945. Nowadays, we have 118 members. They are in Switzerland and in Brazil. And the profile of our members are very diversified, uh, from big industries to small service offices. There are 400 uh, Swiss companies in Brazilian market. And we believe that the top three opportunities in Brazil for the Swiss uh, companies are medtech, cleantech, and infrastructure. Our main activities are we are specialists in organized events to promote networking between our members. Uh, besides, we organize two Swiss pavilions in two important trade fairs in Sao Paulo. Um, we also connect uh, our member. Uh, we also connect our members uh, in many different aspects. So, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I am available after the presentations. Hello, good evening. My name is Jenny Skill. I'm here representing the Swiss Paraguayan Chamber of Commerce. Like Panama, I hope to surprise you because many of you might not have heard yet about some key insights of Paraguay. So uh, I'll be waiting outside as well to share a little bit in depth, but some important insights would be Paraguay responds to a free market economic model. We have the oldest currency in Latin America, which also demonstrates our financial and macroeconomic stability. The, um, we also have one of the youngest demographics, uh, the largest youngest demographics, 64% of our population being under 35 years old, which also translates to being you know, a trainable labor force Paraguay has never been in default or registered uh, in hyperinflation. There are no capital control, no currency um, limit, uh, sorry, <laughs> no currency exchange restrictions. There are, a, we also have the lowest tax burden in the region being 10% for corporate tax income. There are no capital control, like I've mentioned, I'm sorry. But Paraguay also has a steady economic growth in average, we're talking about a 4.4% per year in the last 15 years. And I'm also, I don't mean to brag, <laughs> maybe a little bit specially standing next to Brazil and Argentina. <laughs> but we are also the number one leader in favorable business climate in Latin America. And we are number one in generation of renewable energy. Our key economic uh, drivers are cattle raising, agriculture, and of course the, <laughs> the shared Itaipu hydroelectric dam. So thank you very much. I'll be waiting with you outside and tell you a little bit more of how our chamber could, and key <laughs> location could contribute with your business. Uruguay. Ah, Uruguay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to talk about Uruguay. I represent the Swiss Uruguayan Chamber of Commerce. I'm a board member, the general secretary could not come. Um, I would just stress out some points which are not here on, on the slide, which I think are very important for Uruguay, so the Swiss business um, companies could uh, make business in Uruguay. Uh, Switzerland, uh, URI is known as Switzerland of Latin America since 1951 in an article of New York Times. Um, it is politically stable and financially stable. Um, we have a Swiss bank, a Swiss commercial bank called Banque Heritage, which some years ago bought, uh, bought the bank Sudamedis. So we have already a Swiss bank locally. 
There are about 100 Switzerland-related companies acting in Uruguay. Uh, we are a very sustainable country. We have 97% of the electricity produced today is produced in a sustainable way. Uh, Nestle opened a very big factory uh, for coffee production in 2020, which is also very interesting. Uh, we have 11 free trade zones in Uruguay. Uh, the profits of those companies who act there are basically tax-free. Uruguay as, is, as you know, uh, part of Mercosur, so you can have a customs tax-free export to Brazil and Argentina. Um, we have lots of double tax uh, treaties, for instance, with Switzerland, Germany, Liechtenstein, and many other countries in Europe. Uh, what is very important is also the tax situation, foreign residents who invest in businesses or who buy real estate in a certain amount have a tax holiday for 10 years, which is, I think, uh, there is no other country in Latin America which has that. Uh, Uruguayan companies pay tax at the rate of 25%, but um, the dividends received from subsidiaries abroad are tax-free. Trading companies also um, pay very little taxes. They pay basically 0.96% on their trading, uh, trading profits. Uruguay is a perfect hub for the connoisseur. Um, it, the ports are very modern and infrastructure is very good, special for container shipping. And, uh, well, welcome. I hope that um, you can, that we can help you to, we would be delighted at Swiss Jam to help you to open a business uh, in our country. Good afternoon, I'm Maria Silvia Avalo. I come from the Swiss Argentine Chamber of Commerce. Mine is a very old chamber. It comes from 1938, and we have 170 members. Argentina is a big country. I would like you to remember that. I think there are many, many opportunities. It's a country with 46 million inhabitants, 3.7 square kilometers of beautiful land, and there's a good level of education. Uh, Swiss exports to Argentina in 2021, as has been said, were 500 million. But same products were bought by Argentina for 2,000 million. So I think there is a big opportunity. Actually, with uh, the guidance of Dr. Nell, we conducted a study on opportunities on clean tech and med tech. You should take a look at it. It is in SGE's uh, website. Uh, investment areas, mining, R&D, pharmaceutical, chemical, energy, software, IT services, innovation, and tourism. What do we do? Partner search, business opportunities, market analysis, search for a distributor, and many, many more things you can ask us to do. Thank you very much. Hi, last but not least, I am Constanza Cárdenas from the Swiss Chilean Chamber of Commerce. Um, well, uh, the Swiss Chilean Chamber of Commerce, that figure is not correct. We were founded in 1955, so it's 67 years, we have 67 years um, that we're living. Um, we are 92 members before the pandemic, we were more, obviously, like Peru, the figures went down. But anyway, I just wanted to share with you that we are a boutique uh, chamber of commerce because we only sort of allow uh, Swiss companies that have a link with Switzerland. Um, in Chile, you have at least 150 or 200 more Swiss companies. Um, our most attractive sectors, obviously, is mining. Um, and then we have agrotech, finance and infrastructure. And our main activities are here. I want to point out about the five committees. We have five committees, which is finance, sustainable committee, the communications community, committee, innovation committee, and mining, obviously. And in these committees, the, the associates uh, share their good practices. But at the same time, they think about making a very big social impact in Chile because they're Swiss companies. They're the best in innovation, the best in clean tech, the best... Practically, in, if we think about Swissness, the best in everything. So uh, what we're doing now, just a detail, in the Sustainable Committee, we're worried about the uh, gender equity. 
we sent out a survey to all our companies to see how they're doing in gender equity. With the data we're going to have, if the figure is good, we're going to go into the press and show how the Swiss companies, uh, backed by the Swiss Chilean Chamber of Commerce, you know, have great figures and respect gender equity. And, uh, well, the Swiss investments is two billion in Chile. And lastly, I just want to say, we have a great opportunity for green energy. In the south of Chile, we have um, hydrogen, green hydrogen. And obviously, as we are a big mining country, we're always thinking on becoming a green mining country. So if you want to know more, I'll be in the networking um, uh, out there, and we can just have a chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Swiss Chambers. This was a great presentation, very well prepared by all of you in coordination with SGE. Let's have a round of applause for them again, please. We are now taking a break to recharge our batteries. I invite all of you to join us for refreshments and networking. Take the opportunity to meet our partners from the Swiss Chambers for bilateral discussions in the opposite room, F001 and 002. And see you back here in half an hour, that is five past five.